Digital Foundry is proudly sponsored by Omen's new wireless range of mice, keyboards and headsets. First promised by Sony way back in March when Mark Cerny delivered his Road to PlayStation 5 presentation, it's taken six months of diligent waiting, but it's finally arrived. A teardown of the final retail PlayStation 5 console. What do you see is what you get, really. Literally a man in a room with a PS5 console taking it to bits. What you aren't getting is much in the way of in-depth technical details about the machine and why it's built in the way that it is. In fact, I've noticed quite a big dividing line between Sony and Microsoft in how they deliver their next generation console information. With Sony, there seems to be a less is more approach. Feed information to users, but do so sparingly and leave a lot of questions open and unanswered. Now, as a journalist, this is not entirely satisfactory, but in terms of leaving the audience hungry and stoking discussion, there's no doubt that this strategy has done a pretty amazing job in delivering hype for the system. Compare and contrast with Microsoft, where we've had the chance to meet the people who actually made the machine and to even have a go at constructing it ourselves. But more to the point, we know the story and the vision behind the design. And even with the most incidental details, Microsoft has given us direct answers to direct questions. Now, I'm sort of wondering whether maintaining this air of mystery in the way that Sony has may well have been the better PR strategy, bearing in mind the huge hype level that's out there. So perhaps there's a different, more aloof approach from Sony here. Yasuhiro Otoi here is one of Sony's key design personnel. His name is over a bunch of PlayStation patents up to and including the PS5 dev kit patents that were revealed last year. Funnily enough, he also appeared to present the PlayStation 4 teardown way back in November 2013. Clearly then, he's the real deal. The video begins by him explaining that the entire rear of the unit effectively is an exhaust port. Uh, before we start to see one of the first interesting aspects of the design, a screw on base. Now, hardly high tech stuff here, but definitely practical. You see, one of the most annoying things about console design, in my opinion, is the need to buy a vertical stand. Crazy money for what is effectively a bit of plastic. Thankfully, that's not required for PS5. And uh, this stand actually seems to have had a bit more thought put into it. The stand is essential in allowing the user to stack the console vertically. And that's the configuration which requires the screw there. Then we have this horizontal configuration where the stand kind of slots in and the screw is stowed within the stand itself. Of course, Microsoft's social media team kicked into gear here by showing how much easier it is to do the same job on Series X mostly by virtue of its squared off box-like design. You literally just turn it over. It's the weird and wonderful shape of PS5 that requires the stand in the first place and the shape itself. Well, interesting, right? But I think this is all about ensuring airflow through the unit. The teardown continues by showing how the white side panels can be almost peeled back and then slid off the main chassis where beyond the gigantic size of the console itself, we get our first look at how the machine is called, with a single fan enabling airflow via two inlets, one either side of the chassis. Also interesting are the dust catching outlets. So the main problem with PS4 and PS4 Pro getting loud and overheating over time, is down to the cooling assembly getting clogged up with dust. With PS5, Sony aims to mitigate this problem by allowing you to basically vacuum out the dust. It's a huge improvement, especially as attempting to do the same job on PS4 requires you to basically dismantle the console and void your warranty in the process. The other main issue with PS4 cooling, uh, the quality and the application of thermal grease, well, that gets addressed later on in the teardown. Now, returning to the action here, more importantly, in the short term at least, here's the reveal of the M2 storage bay where Sony allows users to boost SSD space by allowing for specific whitelisted NVMe PCIe 4.0 drives to be installed. Again, 
a very different strategy compared to Microsoft. With Xbox, you have a plug-and-play bespoke drive created by Seagate. Sony lets you buy third-party drives, but only those that match or exceed the performance of the platform holder's highly bespoke SSD solution. So, I'm a bit curious about this bay. SSDs get hot, really hot. And when they do, performance degrades. So I've got a fair amount of questions here. Does a bare NVMe drive require a heatsink? Will SSDs with their own heatsinks fit into this storage bay? Is the storage bay cover itself a heatsink? Maybe I'm getting a bit obsessed by heat dissipation here, but I'm genuinely curious about this. Does the general proximity to the main fan help at all here, I wonder? SSD thermal constraints are definitely a thing. And of course, Sony will know this. So I'm sure there is a solution here. It's just not specifically highlighted in this particular video. A bit later on in a teardown, we do actually get to see the uh, integrated SSD located way across the mainboard there. That's the dedicated controller chip in the center there, surrounded by NAND flash modules operating in parallel to produce that phenomenal 5.5 gigabytes per second of maximum theoretical bandwidth. We know the spec points already, but they are reiterated here, and the potential speeds are extraordinary even before hardware decompression is factored into the equation. I guess my main concern would be the integrated nature of the solid state solution and the fact that it can't be replaced by the user. A recent leak suggests that the system has 664 gigabytes of space available to the user versus 802 gigs in Xbox Series X. The leak does look compelling, but I can tell you that development kits and test stations, certainly the ones I've seen, uh, have 620 gigabytes of usable space. So I'll be interested to see how all of this actually shakes out on final retail hardware. Either way, I do think that the race is on for SSD manufacturers to get a Sony approved M2 drive to market as quickly as possible at a price that's right, or at least a price that's palatable. Returning to the teardown, and I think what strikes me the most here is how relatively basic the design is. I think maybe Toyota-like might be a better description. Conservative, but based on tried and tested principles, if you like. I think the one thing to bear in mind is that fewer parts can actually be a really good thing, especially if you are facing cost challenges, as both Microsoft and Sony definitely are. But here, a couple of pieces of plastic are removed, then the fan cover itself comes away and we get our first look at the fan itself. Big at 120 millimeters, but still smaller in terms of diameter than Xbox Series X. However, in terms of depth, it's a lot larger at 45 mil. Now, I like custom designs and I don't think I've seen anything quite like this in the PC space. After that, the top section of the casing is removed and we're given a closer look at the UHD Blu-ray drive. The first time we've seen such a unit in a Sony console. Acoustics from this one will be interesting as the design suggests that Sony has done a fair amount of work in reducing vibration as the disc spins. And there was a similar focus for this with Microsoft uh, back when they designed Xbox One X and I assume the same focus is in Series X2. Here, it looks like Sony's BD drive rests on standoffs within a custom shell. With that, the teardown continues with the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi 6 antennas removed. So Bluetooth, pretty straightforward. But what's Wi-Fi 6? Well, 9.5 gigabits per second is the theoretical bandwidth limit here on this new standard, but let's be honest, it's highly unlikely you'll get anything like that in real life conditions. I think what's more interesting for me is that Wi-Fi 6 is designed to reduce crosstalk between the various Wi-Fi devices you have in your home, making for a more solid connection overall. You'll need a Wi-Fi 6 router and Wi-Fi 6 devices to see the benefit, but hey, PS5 is still back compatible with all of your existing networking kit. After the antennas are removed, the shielding comes off and we get to see the underside of the unit. As the SOC clamp is removed here, you'll see the main GDDR6 memory modules. Eight DRAM modules here, a 256-bit interface, uh, max bandwidth 448 gigabytes per second. Nothing new here. The board is removed from the case, flipped over, and we get to have a look at the front of the board and the SOC itself. 
We then get a basic reprise of the specifications of CPU and GPU, but as is customary from Sony, there is no measurement of this 7 nanometer die. The size of the chip is kind of important as it gives us some idea of the economics in constructing the whole console. But before we dive into that, I think it's worth dwelling on the design of the board itself. It's big, really big. Compare and contrast with the two smaller, packed Xbox Series X boards, the processor board and the accompanying Southbridge board. So back to the SoC, last time we attempted to eyeball a die size with Xbox Series X, we were quite a way out. But there have been some efforts to measure the PS5 uh, chip size here, with measurements in the 305 to 310 square millimeter area, up against the 360 square millimeters of Xbox Series X. I think the important thing to stress is that these measurements on the PS5 side are derived from comparing to the memory package size, but there's no square on shot here. Uh, so the minutest of errors in pixel counts can cause some pretty big errors when it comes to calculating area. With that said, I think a 305 to 320 square millimeter measurement is probably on the money. We can assume that the chip is likely produced on the same process as Xbox Series X, where we have a proper die shot and an official die area direct from Microsoft. And of course, the underlying AMD technologies are the same too. Sony's processor has the same CPU technology, but a reduced compute unit count. Using the Microsoft die shot, we can tell how much area the extra G6 memory controllers and compute units will take, likely around 44 square millimeters. There will be variances in surrounding fabric and the media block, plus the Tempest engine for 3D audio is a bit of an unknown quantity. But the more you take away from the Series X to match PS5 spec, the closer you get to a chip that's about the same size or smaller than PS4 Pro's processor, again around 320 square millimeters. So while the PS5 may have a similar chip size, uh, to the PS4 Pro, there's a ton of extra performance and that's coming from the combination of the smaller 7 nanometer process and of course the much higher clocks. To help handle those much higher clocks, Sony has chosen liquid metal for its thermal interface that connects the die to the thermal assembly. So yeah, remember when I said that the thermal grease was one of the weak spots in PS4 and Pro's design? Well, you can consider the PS5 solution as something of a nuclear option. It's simply the most optimal thermal interface available, really, for a mass market device. Now, in a PC environment, there are concerns over the longevity of liquid metal, which may give pause in a mass produced machine like the PS5. But again, let's just remember that Sony has developed five generations of console now and has learned a lot of lessons along the way. We're even told here of the efforts that have gone into testing this particular solution. Next up, a look at the freakishly ginormous heatsink. There's no vapor chamber here, but Sony talks about how the shape and airflow give the same performance. I think generally the strategy with PS5 is pretty obvious. Blast the SoC with a ton of power, distribute that power between CPU and GPU according to load, but then rely upon a brute force cooling solution to dissipate the heat. Liquid metal ensures optimal connection between the chip and the heatsink. Plenty of space around the key areas of heat helps with dissipation, and the curvy case design ensures that intake of cool air can't be blocked off by the user. The sheer size of the unit obviously helps in dissipating the heat. So I find it intriguing that Sony and Microsoft developed two very different solutions to grappling with the same next generation challenge. Xbox Series X goes wider with more GPU silicon and much higher levels of memory bandwidth. It's power hungry for sure, hence this incredible level of industrial design in sorting out airflow and ensuring that the SoC runs at full clocks no matter what the workload. That level of construction and the fact that remarkably Xbox Series X looks to be significantly smaller than PS5 is a great achievement. But at the same time, the bigger SoC, the more complex design, this inevitably means a higher build cost. The PS5 solution on the other hand is, as I said, uh, more conservative. We have some exciting flourishes like the liquid metal thermal interface, uh, but there's a keener eye, I think, towards build cost here. It's a bigger, simpler mainboard design. 
there's a mostly conventional design to the cooler and an emphasis on sheer area to dissipate heat and to really push that power through the processor. The boost clock, I still find this to be a fascinating approach to processor performance, but I'm still kind of curious to see how all of that's going to eventually pan out. But going back to the teardown, yeah, pretty meaty 350 watt power supply. That's the last major piece of the puzzle we get to see before the view pans back to show all of the system components. But yeah, 350 watts, well, that's a higher power delivery than Xbox Series X's 315 watts. But it's a comparison that's mostly academic until we can actually see what each unit pulls from the mains with the systems fully under load. But anyway, that's the PlayStation 5 and its internal construction. For me, really, the proof of the pudding, obviously, is going to be in the tasting. Initial hands-on from Japanese influencers suggest it really is whisper quiet, and that's really what we need from our consoles. The price we're paying for that is in the sheer size and possibly the heft of the console, but I don't really want to comment about any of that until we're actually hands-on with the hardware. Yeah, there's no shadowy NDAs or whatnot in effect here. We genuinely don't have the PlayStation 5 in-house, but it's surely just a matter of time, right? Well, that's all for me for now. Please do like and subscribe to support our work. And of course, ring the bell for instant notifications when we put new content live on YouTube or indeed when we live stream something. But of course, there's our Patreon as well. And that's there for those that love what we do and want to support the team more directly. This gives you access to pristine quality video downloads of our work. And with Series X and PS5 incoming, that may well appeal to you. But anyway, that's it. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry. Featuring its new warp wireless technology, Omen's PC peripherals allow for lag-free gaming. From the 360-degree audio of its Omen frequency headphones, the 180-hour battery life of the vector mouse, and the 2.4 GHz connection of its spacer keyboard, Omen has you covered for the ultimate wireless experience.